Thank you for joining me for the third study of the Bible Overview. Today we're in Genesis chapter 3. So I encourage you, if you have a Bible, go ahead, get it, open it up to Genesis chapter 3, and let's study this together. Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The serpent. As we go through the Bible different times, we're going to find this serpent being referred to again and again. Who is the serpent? He's actually talking not just of any snake, but of the devil, Satan. We have different words by which we know him. What's he doing? Where did he come from? We, we've covered God creating the heavens and the earth. We, we covered uh, the creation of man and woman. But now all of a sudden we have the serpent. We have Satan, the devil, uh, appearing on the scene. Where did he come from? Well, I want you to back up with me just a little bit. It's, remember in Genesis 1 it said, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Well, we know from other passages that when God created the heavens, apparently he created angels, an innumerable number of angels, just by speaking. And angels are spirit beings that he made to be his servants to, to help him do whatever his bidding was. And much of that has to do with us, ministering to us. How do we know that? Well, there are different verses in the Bible, and I'm going to take you to shortly, but I guess first, before we jump into that, I want you to know when God gave us his word, this is his communication to us, people. And the primary concern of God is that we know him and we know about us. There's not as much in here about angels, and, and a lot of people want to get carried away and talk about angels and everything else, but quite honestly, the Bible doesn't have a whole lot to say about angels. The primary focus is on God himself and on people. But he does tell us some things. So for this, what I'm going to do is I want you to, to look at Job with me. Job, if you open up your Bible to about the middle, you'll probably end up in Psalms. And before Psalms, you have Job. Uh, it's one of the books before the Psalms. And I'm in Job chapter 38. Chapter 38. It's when God created the heavens and well actually here in 38 God is speaking to Job and and trying to get Job to to think about who he's been addressing who he's been talking about and in Job 38 God asked Job a question he says where were you when I laid the earth's foundation tell me if you understand who marked off its dimensions surely you know who stretched the measuring line across it on what were its footings set, or who laid its cornerstone, while the morning stars sang together, and all the angels shouted for joy. There's a whole lot going here in Job that I don't want to necessarily jump into, but, but what's interesting is as God is addressing Job, he talks about the creation of the earth, and he mentions that at the creation of the earth, when God created the earth, the morning stars sang together, the angels shouted for joy. So apparently when God created the heavens and the earth, when he created the heavens, he must have created the angels at that point. They were there to witness as God created the earth there on the first day. Now one of those angels was Lucifer, or the morning star. And we read about him a little bit in Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 14. Now Isaiah is after Psalms. Again, open up about the middle of the Bible. You got the Psalms or somewhere after Psalms, but Isaiah is one of the major prophets. Just keep keep turning the pages till you get to Isaiah. Or if you look in the index of your Bible, the very front, you should find an index where you can find all the books of the Bible, and you have uh, Psalms and Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Songs, Isaiah, and it tells me what page it's on. So you can look up on the index, find Isaiah, find the page number, and then we have chapters, so we're in chapter 14, and we're going to start in verse 12, Isaiah 14, 12. How you have fallen from heaven, morning star, son of the dawn. You've been cast down to the earth, 
You who once laid low the nations, you said in your heart, I will ascend to the heavens. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the mount of the assembly, on the utmost heights of Mount Zaphon. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. We see that here he was. He was a beautiful angel that God created. But pride filled his heart. And he wanted to be like the Most High. There's another, another passage that refers to this over in Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 28. And again, you can find it in the index. You can find Ezekiel. You can turn to it. Pause the video if you have to. Get to Ezekiel 28, and then we can read it together. So Ezekiel chapter 28, and verse 13. Well, oh, sorry, excuse me. Ezekiel 28. Ezekiel chapter 28. We're going to start in verse 12. Son of man, take up a lament concerning the king of Tyre and say to him, This is what the sovereign Lord says. Now in the Bible we find out that often behind kings and kingdoms there are spiritual kings. There's a spiritual world that is behind what's going on in this physical world. And so he's talking not so much to the physical king at this point, he's talking to the spiritual king of Tyre. He says, you were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone adorned you. Carnelian, chrysolite, emerald, topaz, onyx, and jasper, lapis lazuli, turquoise, and beryl. Your settings and mountings were made of gold. On the day you were created, they were prepared. You were anointed as a guardian cherub, for so I ordained you. You were on the holy mount of God. You walked among the fiery stones. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created till wickedness was found in you. Till wickedness was found in you. Through your widespread trade, you were filled with violence. You sinned. So I drove you in disgrace from the Mount of God. I expelled you, guardian cherub, from among the fiery stones. Your heart became proud on account of your beauty, and you corrupted your wisdom because of your splendor. So I threw you to the earth. I made a spectacle of you before kings. We find out that this guardian cherub, this morning star, Lucifer, means morning star, his name, this angel that God kind of created as, as one of the chief angels over God's throne. And he was beautiful, he's full of wisdom, but he, in pride, felt he was so great that he could be like God. In fact, maybe he could raise his throne above God's. He wanted to be God. And that is sin, not staying in his proper place of being under God's authority, but instead trying to do what he wanted to do, to be his own God. And God would not have that. And so he cast him out of his position to the earth. There are other passages in the Bible that refer to him now as Satan, the devil, the ruler of the air, the prince of this world, few different titles, few different names, but we know that he was an angel created by God to be perfect. He was perfect when God created him, but pride filled his heart. He wanted to be God, and so he sinned. He fell short of what God had made him to be. And that who is who the serpent is here in Genesis chapter 3. So some point between the creation of the earth and Adam and Eve being put in the garden, because apparently Satan was there in the garden. He was there adorned with all these precious stones. But at some point, he sinned. And so we have him now in his fallen state coming to the man and the woman in the garden, speaking to them. And what he says is, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? 
Notice how he twists what God's words are. God had said to Adam back in chapter 2, you may eat freely from any tree in the garden, just not the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And so Satan, that's what he does. He takes God's words and he twists them slightly. He twists them and tries to create doubt. Did God really say... The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden. We may eat fruit. And she was right in what she said here. So she went on. But God did say, you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden. And she's still right. But she goes on, and you must not touch it or you will die. Eve was right in most everything she said. We can eat from any tree in the garden. We just may not eat from the tree in the middle of the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. She left that little detail out too. But then she added something. We must not touch it. God never said that. We get into trouble when we don't listen to everything God says or when we add to what God says. Keep that in mind. That is, those are the two major flaws where we fall short of what God wants us to, to be, what he wants us to do when we ignore parts of what he says or when we add to what he says. She added to it. And that's going to lead to a downfall here shortly. Satan replied to the woman, You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. He starts trying to create doubt. Now he just flat out contradicts God. No, you won't die. You'll be like God. And that's the very temptation he fell into. He wanted to be God. He didn't want to be the creation under God's authority. He wanted to be his own God. And now that's what he holds out to Eve. You'll be God. When the woman saw the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together, made coverings for themselves. She saw the fruit of the tree was good for food. Oftentimes temptation comes in things that would appeal to our bodies, to our flesh, to us physically. It was pleasing to the eye. Mm. Oftentimes, temptation comes and things that are appealing to our eyes. Uh, old time, they used to say, uh, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and, well, also desirable for gaining wisdom. The pride of life. Pride, wanting to be wiser than somebody else, or wanting to be God. I want to be top dog. Pride. Lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, the pride of life are the same things that tempt us today in different forms, but still come in the same means. That's what they faced. And what's interesting is that Adam was right there. When God gave that first command that you may eat from any tree in the garden, freely eat from any tree in the garden, just don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, it was to Adam that God gave the command and then at that, after that, God had created a woman. So Adam must have passed this on to Eve. But even if he didn't pass it on, he was right there with her. He should have known. Wait, 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 Say No, what you're saying is not what God said. But he didn't interject. He didn't stop Eve when she wanted to eat the fruit. He let her try it. You're the guinea pig. See what happens to you. And then he ate. He was right there. Adam really was truly responsible for, for what was going on there, and he didn't step up to be the man. He didn't step up. The eyes of both of them were open. They realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. 
They now had fallen from what God had made them to be, holy and righteous. They were now no longer perfect. And, and they were naked before and unashamed. We saw that in chapter 2. Now that they had fallen from what God had made them to be, their minds were now corrupted. They no longer had all pure thoughts. Now they knew evil, didn't they? Now they knew what evil was, disobeying God. And now that they knew evil, now they had bad thoughts. How many of us struggle with bad thoughts? Fears and worries and thinking ill of other people and not forgiving and holding on to grudges. And a lot of bad thoughts. Hatred, bitterness. All started right here. When Adam and Eve disobeyed God, they were no longer holy and righteous. Now they were sinful because they disobeyed God. And their minds were filled with impure, unholy, unrighteous thoughts. So they sowed fig leaves. How often do you and I, when we try to do, when we do something wrong and somebody comes in, oh, no, I wasn't trying to take cookies out of the cookie jar. Clank, 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 as the cookie jar lid is still settling. We try to hide what we do. We try to cover up. And that's exactly what Adam and Eve did. They tried to cover up what they did by sewing these leaves together. Verse 8, Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? Well, before we move on, there's a lot going on here. They heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden. As we go through the Old Testament, we're going to find different times when God actually appears like a man. And I think that's exactly what's going on here. In Genesis 3, they hear him walking in the garden. You know, when somebody walks and there's a little twig here or there or the, or the rustling of the grass. You can hear somebody walking. They heard him walking. Well, God, being a spirit, doesn't have a body. He doesn't have to walk. So obviously he was appearing as a man here, which is something we're going to see as we go through the Bible. Different times he does that. And, uh, there's a fancy word that Bible scholars have given this called Christophany, uh, a appearance of Jesus earlier on in the Old Testament before he actually came and was born as a man. He appeared as a man oftentimes in the Old Testament. So here he was walking in the garden. They obviously were used to God interacting with them. They knew that this was the time of day, the, the cool of the day, when God would come and talk with them. Because, again, what have we seen about God so far? He, he loves man. He created man to have a relationship with him, and that's what God was doing, having a relationship with them, meeting with them daily, talking with them, loving on them. Only this time, instead of going out and having this loving relationship, Adam and Eve hid when they heard him coming. And God calls out, where are you? Well, wait a minute, I thought God could see everything, knows everything. He does. God does see everything. There are other verses that tell us there is nothing hidden from his sight, and there is nowhere we could go. Psalm 139 is a great passage talking about that. Nowhere we could go to hide from the Lord. So why would God call out, where are you? When God asks questions in the Bible, pay attention. It's important. God doesn't usually ask questions for his sake. He knows the answer. He asks questions to get our attention. Like a teacher asking a classroom. The teacher knows the answer. He asks them to get them to think, to get them to recognize something that's going on. That's what God does. He calls out, Adam, where are you? Because he wants Adam to come to him. Adam answered in verse 10, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. First time we see fear. Fear is such a big part of our lives today, isn't it? Why do we have fear? Because this is no longer a perfect world. We are no longer perfect people, and there are bad people out there, and I'm one of them, and so are you. There are many things to be afraid of, aren't there? Fear started because Adam and Eve disobeyed God 
and fell. They sinned. They fell from what God intended them to be, perfect people in this perfect world, in a perfect relationship with God. They no longer had that, so now they had fear. Fear of the consequence. Fear of what's going to happen. Well, God gives another question. He says in verse 11, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten the tr from the tree that I commanded you not to eat? Again, God asks a question, why? God is wanting Adam to confess, to repent and say, wow, you're right, God, I did something wrong. That's what repentance is. Repentance is a change of the mind where in our mind we're like, where Adam's mind was is he wanted that fruit. He wanted to be God. He wanted, and God wants to see a repentance, a change of his mind where it's no longer about what he wants, but saying, no, God, you were right. I was wrong. God is asking questions to give Adam a chance to repent, to change his mind, and to confess. Unfortunately, it doesn't quite go there. God says, did you eat? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some of the fruit of the tree, and I ate it. You know, if he would have just said, I ate it, that would have been perfect. But instead, what does he do? He does the very same thing that all of us since our forefather Adam did it, have done. We try to shift the blame. Well, I wouldn't have done it if... And he shifts the blame to two people. He shifts it to the woman. The woman... But he shifts it to God, too. The woman you put here with me. She gave me the fruit and I ate it. He tries to shift the blame to Eve and to God. Well, if you wouldn't have, boy, that takes out the wind of the sails when it comes to confessions, doesn't it? If anybody confesses to you, but they say, but if you, well, that just ruins the confession, doesn't it? Same thing with Adam. He wasn't truly repenting and confessing. He was trying to avoid, he was trying to avoid responsibility. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? Again, wanting the woman now to repent, to change her mind away from what she was wanting to say, God, you were right. I shouldn't have done this. But what does she do? The serpent deceived me and I ate. She too shifts the blame. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. Now the serpent, again, was Satan appearing in the form of a snake, of a serpent. What the serpent looked like before, we don't know, but I think God gave us a visual clue so that every time we see snakes or serpents, we would remember why we're in the state we're in right now. Because of the original sin with Adam and Eve and the serpent there in the garden. But he goes on, not just to the serpent, but now more specifically to Satan. He says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. He. When he talks about the woman's offspring, he's, he's talking about a specific offspring. He a male offspring from a woman who is going to crush the head of the serpent. Or, again, in Bible times, to crush the head would be to destroy the authority of something or someone. But you will strike his heel. This. This is God's first foreshadowing of Jesus coming into the world. We'll get to that. We'll get more details on that later. Verse 16 to the woman, he said, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. With painful labor, you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. God gives some discipline, some consequences for Adam and Eve's choice, for their behavior. 
What is discipline? Discipline is to help us understand what we did was wrong. Consequences, to help us understand what we did was wrong so we don't do it again. They're not meant to be pleasant. They have to have some bite to them so that we remember how wrong this was. And that's what he does. He gives some consequences to Eve to remind her, to remind all women down through the ages, this was wrong, to disobey God. To go against our Creator, our Maker, our God, our loving Father is wrong. And so there's discipline to remind us of that. Discipline of pain and childbirth, and He created the woman to be a helpmeet to the man, and for the man to love the woman, that they were in this perfect union where they just worked together. But now her desire would be to be over him, and He was going to be over her, and well, now that we have this tension, and isn't that the tension we face in our homes all the time? Tension over who's in charge and who's who's going to be the one to make decisions. Who's right? Who's... We've been facing that ever since. To Adam, he said, Because you listened to your wife and ate fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you will return. Consequences. Discipline that God gives to remind us that what we did was wrong having to work for our food, and it's not going to be easy. The ground isn't just going to yield food for us to eat anymore. Now it comes with labor and, and fighting through weeds and thistles that want to overtake the crops that we plant, and eventually physically dying, returning to the earth. Adam named his wife Eve because she would become the mother of all the living. She was. The first woman, the mother of all the living. One of the things I want to point out here is notice how God commanded Adam. He said, the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. When Adam and Eve ate from the fruit, did they just drop dead? No, they didn't drop dead. Again, the Bible refers to death, and, and death is a separation. Separation. What immediately happened when they ate from the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is that they were separated from God. They were separated from their creator, from the source of life, from the one who loved them, provided for them, separated from him and all his goodness. They were now separated from him. And being separated from him, the source of life, the one who breathed life into Adam and was the source of life, being separated from him, now their bodies were eventually going to wear out and they were going to physically die, where their soul would be separated from the physical body. Separation is what death is. Spiritual separation is being separated from God, our Creator, and eventually physical separation, the separation of our souls from our physical bodies. We've all inherited that from Adam and Eve, our ancestors who were the parents of all that now live. But God wasn't done yet. You see, God does discipline. He does discipline when people do things that are wrong. But he also shows mercy and grace. Mercy and grace are two things we're going to see all the way through the Bible, and I need to explain them now. What is mercy? Mercy is when you don't get what you deserve. Have mercy on somebody, you don't give them what they deserve. Adam and Eve sinned against their God, their maker, their creator, the one thing that he didn't want them to do, to no evil, they did. They deserve God to outright put them even to physical death, to separate them from him for all eternity at this point. But he didn't do that right away. He didn't. He gave them mercy. He also gave them grace. Grace is when you give somebody something they don't deserve. You know, like a child that's been really bad 
And yet Christmas morning, even after being really bad all of Christmas Eve, Christmas morning he gets up, he still gets his presents. It's grace. He doesn't deserve it, but he gets it. That's what God is about to do for Adam and Eve. He showed them mercy and not immediately putting them to even physical death. But he goes on to give them something more. He gives them grace, something they don't deserve. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. And the Lord God said, Man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat it and live forever. So the Lord God banished him from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. After he drove the man out, he placed on the east side of the Garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. Grace. God in his mercy didn't give them what they deserved. He didn't immediately put them to death physically, eternal separation spiritually from him. Instead, he gave them grace. He closed them. What does he use to clothe them? Garments of skin. In order to have a garment of skin or of some kind of fur, an animal had to die. God took an animal, put it to death, showing Adam and Eve that they deserved to die, to be separated from God for all eternity because of what they had done. They deserved death. But God killed this animal in their stead and then clothed them. He didn't make garments for them and say, hey, here, put this on. No, he clothed them. He still cared for them like a parent dressing a young child, giving them garments to protect them, to help them. What they did on their own, trying to cover up with leaves, was not good. It wasn't going to work. But God said, let me take care of you. I can do this for you. I will help you. And not only that, he... He helped them by banishing them from the Garden of Eden because they, he said it's not good. Now that they are no evil, that they, they have evil thoughts, they are now evil. They are no longer holy and righteous. It's not good for them to eat from the tree of life and live forever. And that is grace. Who wants to live forever in an evil world with evil people? Can you imagine if... Even some of the most evil people in the world never died. Can you imagine if Hitler was still alive today, carrying out all his plots? It's grace that we don't live forever in this fallen, evil world. It's grace that God wanted to protect us from having to always be in this evil world. He still cared for Adam and Eve. He reached out to them. What do we see about God here? We see that God is holy and just. He is unique. He will always do what is right. He will always expect justice to be carried out. We see that he is merciful. He doesn't just immediately give us what we deserve, immediately separating us from him for all eternity. Instead, he gives us grace and he reaches out again in loving care we see when Adam and Eve were sinful and God first came to them, he was calling out, where are you? What have you done? He was asking questions because he wants Adam and Eve to repent, to change their minds about what they were doing, and to confess, to come out and say, God, you are right, this is what I've done, please forgive me. Fortunately, Adam and Eve didn't go there, not right away. But God does reach out to people that are sinful, wanting them to confess, to repent, to change their minds, to confess to him. And he wants to care for them. He wants to provide for them. Well, that's what we see here in Genesis 3. We're going to keep going next time with Genesis chapter 4. But before I close, a lot of people say, why is there evil in this world? If God is so good and perfect and he created the world to be perfect, why is there evil in the world? Well, we just found out why there is evil in this world. God created the heavens and the earth. He made the earth perfect, and he told Adam and Eve to rule over it. He gave the world to man. He is God. He created man, 
And he said, I want you to rule over all the earth. Uh, you, underneath my authority, I want you to rule over the, all the earth. He gave the earth to man. And man, when he had the authority over the earth, instead of living in and under the authority of God, decided to listen to whom? Decided to listen to Satan. And so now Satan is called the prince of the power of the air. The prince of darkness is over this world, over us. Man in his choice handed the whole earth over to be corrupted, to be evil. The world is no longer as perfect as it was when God created it. And so, yes, there is evil in this world because we are evil, because we have chosen evil, and because we have put it under the authority of the evil one, Satan himself. God is not the author of evil, and he will put an end to evil someday. But for now, we live in a fallen world that is full of pain and sorrow because when God gave us the authority over the earth, we chose evil. And we chose to live under the authority of the evil one. That is why there is pain. That is why there is suffering. That is why there is death. But there's hope because God still cares. And we're going to see that as we go through the Bible, how God is going to continue to show man that even though we rebelled against him, he still cares and he wants to make a way for us to live with him back in holiness, back in righteousness, back in a perfect relationship with him in a new perfect world someday. We're going to see all that as we continue our study. I hope you keep going with me through this Bible overview to find out what this is all about.